Okay, folks, so in the last section, we talked about how to find probabilities on the normal distribution or the Z distribution, how to use Excel to find those probabilities, those areas underneath the, the curve. But all the questions that we asked had to do with individual scores, right? And so in this section, we're gonna talk about what happens when you sample something, right? So here we're gonna compute some probabilities in a very similar way to the last section. Okay, but now we're gonna talk about means and sample means instead of just individual scores. <clears throat> we can use the Z distribution to find the probability of a single score. Okay, but what about if we had a sample? Right, when we take a sample, we're only sampling a smaller piece of the population, right? So if we're gonna find the average height of students at the college, right? And I sample everyone in the class. They were just taking a small piece of the students at the college, right? And because they're in the class or just because of any reason, there's always gonna be some kind of bias in the sample, depending on how you choose the sample, right? But also depending on who was chosen in the sample. Okay? You could randomly choose really tall people or really short people. And you would never know if you were just randomly choosing people. That could happen, but in your mind, you kind of know that's probably unlikely. Okay, the larger you sample, right? If we could sample almost everybody in the college, right? We could get really close to that population value, and there'd be way less bias. But that's not always easy, right? It's always possible to sample everybody in a population. When we talk about the average height of people in the United States, you know, you're not gonna be able to sample 300 some plus 400 million people. Right? But if you happen to just sample all of the really tall people or the really short people, right? but if you took a sample on a test and you got just everybody who is all the highest performers or the lowest performers, right? well, your sample means gonna look really large or really small in that case. Right, what's that going to do to your understanding of the data, right? And what does that tell you about your sample, right? Can we figure out if it's unlikely to choose a random sample of basketball players who are all seven feet tall? And it turns out that, yes, we can. Using what I showed you last time, along with one other little piece that I want to explain here. And it has to do with sampling. So just a brief example. You don't have to really keep up with the math too much here, but I'm going to kind of show you how it works. I have done all of that part. But here we have a population of only three scores. Okay, this is a very simple example. Two, five, and eight. It's the only three answers you can have. We're going to sample from the population. We're going to allow replacement. And we're going to sample two people out of the three. Right, or two scores out of the three. With only three scores, there's only nine ways we can do this sample, and they're all listed here, all nine of them. Maybe okay, you could pick two twice, you could pick two and five, two and eight, so on. Okay, then we can find the mean of each of these samples by just adding them up and dividing by two. Right, that's seven divided by two, 10 divided by two, so on. That's what you see here. These are each of our sample means. Now there's only nine possible samples, okay? But in terms of sample means, there's one, two, three, four, there's five different sample means. But notice that a few of them show up more than the others, right? Look at, look how often you choose a sample mean of five. What's the average of two, five, and eight? Well, it's five. I don't mean to write it on the last one. And it turns out that if we were to plot these on a histogram, the sample means that we have, right, the frequency of them makes this nice normal distribution. 
in that we had eight and two only once, five three different times, 3.5 and 6.5. Both showed up twice. This is true for all samples. Okay, so regardless of the distribution of your data, right, in, the, in that case, we only had two, five, and eight. There's no, there's no, um, there's no normal distribution or symmetric distribution to that data. Okay, but the mean and median are equal. Okay, but the sample means that you take from that data, the sample means that you collect are going to be symmetric. So if you're measuring the mean of something and you collect a sample, and then you collect a sample again, most of your samples wind up being equal to the average value of the thing that you're looking for. If we were to sample people over and over again, and take a bunch of samples of height, most of your samples are gonna be average height, people of average height over and over again. You might get a sample that's a little above the, the average or a little below. Okay, but choosing a sample where everybody's seven feet tall, that's going to be really, really unlikely. And you can think how that would be true, but you can also show that using the Z distribution and using um, the probabilities that you learned to find in the last section. We only have to change one thing, right? We need to know the standard deviation of the sample means, right? We need to know the standard deviation of these values, the means of all of our possible samples. Okay, and that just requires a little bit of an adjustment to our actual standard deviation. Okay, the standard deviation of the sample means is a weird thing to say. So we instead call it the standard error or the standard error of the mean. Okay, the standard error in general is a really important part of all the stuff you're going to learn from here on out. It's what distinguishes one type of test from another, okay? the way that you're changing the standard error, how you estimate the standard error, how you estimate the standard deviation of those sample means. And we just don't say that over and over again because it gets, you know, you have to keep repeating all those words. We just call it the standard error. And in this case, it's denoted with that little X with the line over it. Okay, and it is just the population standard deviation divided by the square root of N. The larger the sample size, the smaller the standard error. Right? The larger the sample size, the closer you are to sampling all of the population, the less likely it is that your sample has strayed from the population average. If we we're able to sample nearly everyone when we were measuring their height. The mean of that sample is going to be really close to the average. If we're only missing a few people, right, that standard error would be very, very small. If we want to then find the probability, we previously calculated the z-score using the standard deviation that worked for one individual score for one value. If we want to compare our sample mean, which I really should have an X with a line over it here, just now notice that. If I want to compare our sample mean to the population mean, we have to then divide by the standard error. Okay, and so it's the sample mean minus the population mean divided by the standard error. Okay, divided by the standard deviation divided by the square root of m. This will give us a z value. It is a z value for our sample mean. It is a position of the sample mean in this distribution, right? Where does it fall? It's all the same general idea from the last section. It is just going to give us the probability of finding that sample instead of the probability of finding that individual score. We just have to adjust how we find Z. Here we have the EPA rates the mean highway gas mileage of 2011, 27 miles per gallon. So 
the mean is 27 miles per gallon. Standard deviation is three. A rental company buys 60 of these cars. What's the probability that the average mileage is greater than 26.5 miles per gallon? And so our average mileage we want for these 60 cars, the, the sample mean is going to be 60. I'm sorry, it's going to be 26.5. Sample size is 60. To find the standard error, we just take our standard deviation of three divided by the square root of the sample size, three divided by the square root of 60. You need a calculator for that one. Zero point three eight seven three. And it's best to go to three or four decimal places here as you do these types of calculations um, just to make sure that you don't mess up rounding when you're plugging them into your homework and things like that. To then find Z, we just need to find our sample mean, 26.5, minus the population value of 27, divided by now the standard error 0 0.3873. As he is definitely going to be negative, 26.5 minus 27 divided by 0.3873. That gives us a Z value of negative 1.29. What's the probability of the fleet is greater than that value? So we want the area to the right of that Z value. Okay, and then we can go to Excel to find this part. We wanna find the area to the right and we wanna use Excel. We're gonna say equals one minus so we can get the area to the right. 1 minus norms dist will give us the area to the left. We're 0 point or point, this is going to be not 0 0.9015, or 90.15%. So there's 90.15% probability that the average mileage of all 60 of those cars will be above. 26.5 miles per gallon. Let's look at another example. The mean annual income for people in a certain city is 42 or 42,000, standard deviation of 30,000. We're going to sample 90 people. So here we have the mean is 42 or 42,000, standard deviation is 30,000. We're going to choose a sample of 90 people. What's the probability that the sample mean is between 40 and 45? Okay, well, here again, we want the standard error, which is the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So 30 divided by the square root of 90. 3.16 to find our z scores we want to know between 40 so that's our lower this is our first sample mean this is our second sample mean minus 42 divided by 3.1623. So that's negative two divided by 3.1623 or negative 0.6325. The upper 
z value 45 minus 42 divided by 3.1623. Zero point nine four eight seven. And so we have negative zero point six three, positive, we'll call it point nine five. Just to draw it a little easier. And so we're looking for the area between these two values. Remember again, um, when we want to do this in Excel, find the area between two, you're gonna have to find the area of the upper value minus the area of the lower value. So 0.95 minus the area of negative 0.63. And we find that this is 0.5646. And you could have used these values in Excel as well and got a slightly more specific answer, but 56.46% probability that your sample mean income will fall between those two values, between $40,000 and $42,000. Here we have engineers that want to design an elevator to accommodate 40 people. The maximum weight um, it can safely hold is 8,120 pounds. Then we've got some stats for males and females. Let's answer some questions about this. So if 40 people are on the elevator and their total weight is 8,120 pounds, what's their average weight? Okay, so that's the first thing we need is we need, what's the population mean? What's the mean that we're, we're comparing to, right? What's the thing that we need to know? We need this, these 40 people to average out to whatever 8120 divided by 40 is. Eighty-one twenty divided by 40 is 203. So we need these folks to average out to a weight of 203 pounds per person. Okay. If we randomly sample 40 adult women to ride the elevator, what's the probability that we will exceed the safe weight. So it's the probability that it's above this value, right? I'm sorry, this is the, the safe safety weights, still the value we're comparing to. I still got that backwards. This is our sample mean. These are our population values because we're gonna sample 40 women. Let's see, where's our, our values for, adult women have a mean of 164 pounds, standard deviation of 77. Okay, so we're gonna sample 40 women The standard error is going to be the standard deviation divided by the square root of 40. In this case, 77 divided by the square root of 40. 12.173. Now, we don't want it to exceed this value. Right? So we want 203. We don't want it to be above. What's the probability that it's above that? What's the probability that we go above 203? And so this is the value that we're going to use to find Z. That is our mean that we're interested in. Okay, because we're sampling 40 women, our population mean is 164 divided by the standard error 12.173. That will give us a Z value for where 203 is. 203 minus 164 divided by 12.173. Whoops.
3.2, let's call it 3.20. So this is Z equals 3.20. If we want to find the area above that, again, we can use Excel. We want the area above Z equals 3.20, or we can, so we can do one minus the area below. And let's point zero, 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 seven. There's a 0.07% chance that you would exceed the maximum weight. Yeah, let's look at another one. Sorry about the way it kind of jumps each time I do that again. The College Board reports that in 2008, the mean maths SAT score was 515. The standard deviation was 116. We're going to choose a sample of 65. So here we have a mean of 515. And I think we're going to keep these scores for the next few examples. So we wanted to keep recalculating things. Let's take a sample of 65. Okay, now we can find the standard error. Right now, 116 divided by the square root of 65. Fourteen point three eight eight. And so now we want to find what's the probability that the sample mean score is less than 500. Okay, so let's find our Z value for 500. 500 is our sample mean minus 515. And we have to divide by the standard error. Fourteen point three eight eight. Eight. That's negative 15 divided by 14.388 or negative 1.0425. That's our Z value. A negative one be about right here. We want the area to the left of that less than 500 if this is 500. That will give us that probability. Here again with Excel. Sorry that it kind of jumps around, but hopefully it's going to help you guys find these because we want the area to the left. We don't have to do anything special here. The Z value is negative one point, we'll just call it 0 0.0425, like we calculated. And there's point. 1486 or 14.86%. So there's a, about a 15% probability that the sample mean is less than 500. A sample of 65 of the scores. If we want to find the probability that the sample mean will be between 480 and 520, now we just have two sample means, which means we need two Z values. Now let's do the first one over here. 480 minus 515. Okay, our standard error was um, 116 divided by the square root of 65. 14.388. So 480 minus 515 divided by 14.388, negative 2.4, let's call it 2.43. Z number two, we can just write over here. That is 520 minus 515 divided by 14.388. When we calculate that, 0 0.35. And so one Z is about here. The other is all the way over here somewhere. 
And so we just want this area. You don't need to show this every time, but it does kind of help because you can check your answers a little bit. Right? If we should see this be a, should be about 50%. Right? And we can again, go look, we calculate it using Excel. If we just find the area of the upper value, norms dist 0 0.35 minus the area of the lower value, negative 2.43. That's actually more than 50%. 0 0.6293 or 62.93%. So this is a pretty good probability that the sample mean of 65 would be between 480 and 520. We can look at another one. Again, we want to find the 80th percentile. Well, now, we need to know what's the z-score for the 80th percentile. And we can do that again from, here we have to go to Excel first. Remember, if we want to go from the area, we use the I and V, okay? And this will give us to the left, uh, just like the other one. So if we want 80% of the area to the left, that will be the 80th percentile, that gives a Z value of, whoops, let's write it twice, 0 0.8416, let me just see if I can do this, yeah. And now that we've got that value, we know the mean, and we know the standard deviation, if we want to find the 80th percentile of the sample mean, we have to be careful here. Okay, this is going to be a little different. The sample mean, the 80th percentile of the sample mean okay, is going to be the population mean plus Z times the standard error. And so in this case, 515 plus 0 0.8416 times our standard error was 14.388. In the calculator, it goes Plus 515, the score will be 527. So 527 would be the 80th percentile in this case. For the sample mean, where the 80th percentile for an individual score would be different. Okay, this is if you're taking a sample of 65 scores. 80% of your samples will be less than, or will have a sample mean less than 527. And that's what the percentile for a sample mean would imply, is that all of the other samples you could possibly take, 80% of them would be less than that. But it'd be unusual if the sample mean were greater than 550. Okay. Well, remember how we find things to be unusual. Now, we could do this two different ways. Okay, but I'm going to show you one way, um, and you could maybe try it the other way if you want. The other way would be the way um, you might normally do. Remember that we say things that happen less than 5% of the time. We can call those unusual, rare, rare events, right? Remember if we talk about probability choosing the movie, choosing the musical from your friend's um, movie collection, right? It happens like 3% of the time. We said that would be rare. Okay, so it would be unusual for something to happen less than 5% of the time. 
Okay, so greater than 550. Okay, so we don't we want to know where's the boundary for the upper 5% of our sample means. Okay, so we only want this 5%. Well, what will give us this boundary here? Okay, we're at 95% of the area is on the other side. Okay, we can find that Z value. I happen to think I know what it is, but I'm gonna show you guys just real quick. If we want the Z value for where 95% of the area is to the left. Okay, um, and I kind of have it written in a bad place because it should be somewhere about right here. Okay, where 5% is over here. Okay, but that Z value is going to be 1.64. Let's call it 1.645. And I'm going to do the thing where it jumps out again. We shouldn't need Excel anymore. Now, we know our Z boundary for this 5%. Let's figure out what the score would be there. And then we can figure out if greater than 550 would be unusual. Okay, well, the score that would be there, the sample mean for our, our Z value right, that we found for the top 95%, right, we're only 5% above it, the 95th percentile, if you will. Okay, because we're trying to see if it's going to be unusual. That's going to be equal to 515, our sample mean, plus Z times the standard error, 14.388. And so 14.388 times 1.645 plus 515 gives you 538. Point six, let's call it five four thirty eight point seven. Sure, or five. Well, you can even call it five thirty nine if you want, just because so we can deal with whole numbers. So this range, where only five percent is over here, is going to be bounded by five thirty nine. Would it be unusual for you to score to find a sample mean greater than five fifty? Well, yeah, five fifty somewhere over here, probably about where I drew the original line way less than 5%, which means that would be unusual. Now, the other way you could do this is to take your sample mean of 550, subtract 515, divide by 14.388. Okay, and that's going to give you a Z value. That Z value is going to be greater than 1.645, whatever it is which means when you find the area, it'll be less than 5%. Okay, what you're gonna start to see here are different ways of solving similar problems, all kind of linked together by probability. Right? We can either draw this boundary and find where the, the upper 5%, right? these are the least likely scores in the upper range, or we can just calculate that z-score and figure out the direct probability. The way that I showed you the first, the first way that I showed you is actually how we'll do a lot of different tests going forward. The same concept. Do you think it would be, be unusual for an individual to get a score greater than 550? Well, if we're just talking about an individual and not a sample, that's a different thing. Okay, but we still know, we can still answer the question in a similar way. Okay, we still know the boundary for the upper 5%. Right? We still know that unusual boundary for Z, it's 1.645. We know our mean, I'm sorry, we know our mean is still 515. Because we're talking about an individual, we don't need the standard error now, we just need the standard deviation. And we can calculate the upper range of the unusual scores. Right, we can calculate where this x value would be in a very similar way. The 
u plus z times now because it's just the standard deviation because there's only one score not the standard error 1.645 i hope you're going to see very quickly this is well above One point six four five times one one six seven oh five, or we'll just call it seven oh six. So it wouldn't be unusual for a single individual, if you randomly chose them, to have a score greater than five fifty. Okay, you'd have to get up above seven oh six for it to be unusual. If you just randomly chose a single score, but if you randomly choose a sample that probability, that value goes way further down. Because if the average is 515, most of the people you pick will be average. And so that will bring the sample mean down closer to the value in the center of your distribution. For a single score, it's way easier if you're just randomly choosing one person, there's, it's way easier to just randomly choose one basketball player. It's much harder to randomly choose 40 in a row. That would be very unlike, unlikely in terms of probability. Right? If there's a 5% chance that you randomly choose one basketball player, well, each time you have to choose another one after that, you have to multiply those 5% chances and that is essentially 0.05 to the 40th power. And that would be your probability of collecting a sample of those minute, of, of, of 40 basketball players who are all seven feet tall or something like that. 40 really tall people. Okay, that's not exactly how you calculate it, but it's close based on what we, we learned over the past few weeks. That's a good approximation. And if you put that in your calculator, you'll see very quickly that is a really small number really unlikely to repeatedly sample really tall people over and over again. If you repeatedly sample, you're going to repeatedly sample people who are about average, little above, little below. Keep all of this um, in your mind as we go forward. I know that this week will encompass spring break as well. Okay, but these two lessons are really the foundation of understanding everything we're going to do from here on out how we're gonna talk about estimates, how we're gonna talk about hypothesis tests. It all comes to this, it's all this. The same idea of understanding how the probability in this distribution or similar distributions can be determined from the area. If you have questions this week going forward, please let me know. Be safe on spring break and we'll pick this back up in a few weeks in March.